Då hälsar vi alla välkomna till nästa bolag här på Erik Penselbanks temadag och vi har med oss Quickbit som har flera representanter med sig idag. Jag lämnar över ordet direkt. Tack så mycket. Hi everyone, we're going to do this in English today because we have a, a colleague with us from Barcelona today who doesn't speak Swedish, so we're going to try to do it in a way that he so he understands what we're saying as well. Uh, I hope that's okay with everyone. My name is uh, Johan Björklund and I am the Chief Legal and Compliance Officer for QuickBit. Uh, today we will give an intro to what QuickBit is and who we are and what we're doing, uh, but we will also take it one step further to talk about what we think is interesting in this space right now and where we see it heading in the near future. I am, like I said, not going to do this by myself, which is, which, is, which is a good thing. Together with me today I have Gustav, who is uh, a product owner. Uh, Gustav is going to talk a bit about the crypto payment space and how we can sort of leverage the cool stuff that you could do with blockchain and DeFi together to make a cool sort of payment. Uh, 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 payment uh, way of doing things. And Sorya, who is our head of B2B products, is going to take that one step further and talk about the cool products that we are exploring right now that we could potentially do with that. Sorya, who is uh, joining us on video, is a new member to the team and just started a quick bit a few months ago. Uh, he is, he's got a, a long background in payments and you could say that he's a bit of a payment pro. So I'm excited for you guys today because you're going to hear him speak about what he thinks uh, is the next thing that we're going to be able to do. Um, I, on the other hand, is here to talk about QuickBit and the company. I will talk what QuickBit is and what we offer. Uh, seeing as this is a crypto event for the industry, I will also sort of dip my toe a bit into what I see from my sort of regulatory compliance perspective uh, is going on right now and what the next thing is, and how we as a company try to shape ourselves in a way that makes us sort of uh, agile and able to adapt to the changes in this industry right now. Cool. Kind of missed one slide, but I'm jumping straight into uh, to QuickBit. Um, QuickBit is a fintech company that operates in the crypto payment space. So what we want to do is that we want to bridge traditional payments with crypto, offering solutions for consumers to make it easier for consumers to buy and to sell and use crypto, and easier for merchants to accept crypto as means of payment without having to stand the volatility risks that usually is the case with crypto payments, if they don't want to. QuickBit was founded in 2016 in Sweden, and we were listed in 2019. And we have been a very international company from the start. Uh, we are currently having employees in around five countries across Europe, and we have most of our revenue outside of Sweden. Uh, I have to admit that I'm not a numbers guy whatsoever. Ro lawyers rarely are, uh, but uh, I do know a few things, and I have a few sort of quick bit facts that I think is interesting in a, at an event such as this one. Um, I know that we delivered our quarterly report yesterday, uh, and that we showed a stable report in a climate that is anything but stable. If you look at our competitors right now, you can see that it's a very challenging time for companies such as us right now. But despite that, we show that we are making enough money to make sure that we can fund the existing business that we're doing, but also to invest in expansion and invest in future revenue streams. Making sure that we have a stable foundation in the current business model to, eat, to grow even more. I also know that the report yesterday showed that we are delivering on what we have said that we will do in terms of the new features in the products and the expansion plans that we have said that we will do. So all in all, my impression at least, not being the reported kind of a guy, is that the report was very good and that we're showing that we're on the path that we said that we want to be in expansion and making sure that we can fund ourselves in this climate. Uh, QuickBit offers uh, several products in the B2B and B2C segment. Uh, we have worked hard from the beginning to make sure that all of our products are based on the same technical platform. We like to describe it as a vehicle that we then build our, ec build our ecosystem of products on. Basically what that means is that we can add features and new stuff to the same technical platform in a way that, that sort of combines the consumer products with the B2B products that also have a sort of a seamless interaction with each other. The benefit of that is obviously that it's a better experience for the customers and also for the merchants, but the other side of that benefit is also that we can make money in several steps of the same transaction based on the products that we're offering. Um, 
the products that we're currently offering on the consumer side um, is the app, um, the uh, <laughs> uh, on the consumer side is the app. Uh, the app is a um, a base for all of the uh, products that we're adding on to uh, to the offering to the, on the consumer side. So uh, the app started off with just crypto wallets, being meaning that you're able to send and receive crypto, meaning that you're able to swap between different cryptocurrencies. We then added on the Euro accounts to the app in cooperation with Intergyro, our partner. So now you're able to have Euro in the app, you're able to switch between Euro and crypto, send and receive Euro in the app to make it a better experience altogether. But what what are you supposed to do with Euro and crypto in app if you can't spend it? So we also added the card very recently. So now you can use the Visa card in any place that accepts Visa payments. And you can also use your crypto, change it to Euro, and then pay with the crypto slash Euro in any shop anywhere that accepts Visa. That together means that you can now have sort of the whole system of it, both the crypto side, but also the payment side. Going back to where I started, saying that we're trying to make sure that we combine those two worlds with each other in a seamless way for the consumers. Next steps in the app will be to add the earn function, which will mean that you can earn interest in a way on your crypto by yielding that crypto in the app. So that is just the first step of sort of adding on features to that technical platform, which is the app for us that we can then offer to our consumers. On the merchant side, we have the affiliate product. Uh, the affiliate product is sort of the product where we, seems like the slides is in a completely different order, but never mind. Uh, the uh, uh, affiliate product is the product that we started off with from the beginning in 2016. It's been a super successful product. What it essentially is, is a way for consumers to be able to buy crypto and then use their crypto to pay with to merchants. So it's kind of a B2B, B2C product uh, in that way. That product's been very successful. It's still sort of our main revenue stream in the company, and it's really sort of something that we try to build on. But the next step in the merchant segment will be to, add, to sort of add the real proper merchant product, which, which we're sort of in the final steps of launching right now. The merchant product will be a better portal for the merchant, where they can get a better understanding of their economy right now. They can see the transactions, they can see what they've sold, they can manage their own sort of financials in, in sort of that uh, product, which is going to be kind of an affiliate 2.0 for us, uh, making sure that the merchants can sort of go into that um, product. Then going into uh, sort of uh, my area, uh, working with things that I do, you realize that uh, the business that we are doing is not primarily affected by any local regulatory requirements. Uh, QuickBits business and the entire crypto space is by nature not tied to any specific region or geographical area. That's kind of the point of the whole thing. For QuickBit, we're not necessarily primarily concerned about how the discussions is this space is locally progressing in Sweden. Uh, we may be a company that's listed in Sweden, but our sort of business is a European business. Most of our, our revenue is generated across Europe from other countries than Sweden, and that's also where we are launching some of the new products that we're looking at right now. The international focus that we have allows us to dip into two pools of value. One of those pools is the pool of talent. So being an international company with Europe as our playground, we can look for talent in a lot of countries other than just Sweden. We don't have to recruit by proximity just because we need to have find someone in Sweden. We can find the best talent no matter where they live and we can hire them in that place. The other pool that we're dipping into is the obvious one, the consumers. It goes without saying that you have more consumers in Europe than you have in just Sweden, which is also a huge benefit for us, which opens up a lot of doors for us when it comes to acquiring new customers. I would therefore uh, say that Euro Europe is the market that we're looking at, if you can call Europe a market. Um, the uh, interesting thing with that is that it also goes to show with how we're structuring ourselves. So right now we have uh, licenses and registration which allows us to do business in, uh, for instance, Norway, Finland, Lithuania, and we're also allowed to conduct business in Italy, for instance. That is a way of, for us to, to sort of be able to grow outside of Sweden. The complicated thing right now is the licensing regime in Europe, though. For a company such as QuickBit, if we want to target customer in a specific, specific region, we need to have a local license in that region, which makes it very tricky because it also means that we have to adapt to local laws and regulations and local sort of requirements on that business. 
And my experience from being part of seven or eight license or registration applications over the last two years is that it differs a lot. For instance, I'm currently living in, uh, in Gibraltar, which is one of the countries in Europe that were the first ones to introduce crypto legislation. Uh, they were very early in making sure that there was clarity around what crypto companies needed to do. And that's also one of the reasons why Crypit chose to have some of our products in Gibraltar very early on, because it was clear what the requirements on the company were in Gibraltar. Gibraltar was the first country to uh, launch or regulate crypto uh, legislation in Europe, and they're now working with high efforts to take it one step further. Uh, Gibraltar has just proposed new regulations for cryptocurrency, uh, taking aim at potential market manipulation and insider trading. So they are trying to force the crypto space into something that is more similar to the financial industry in general, which we can see. All in all, this is done to protect the consumers and also to protect the companies, because predictability is something that's good for a company, because that means that you can invest without having to be sort of afraid of it having to being shut down, which is the case in, for a lot of our competitors, for instance. Um, Gibraltar is a scene of uh, where a lot of international cryptocurrencies are basing themselves because of this, and we're part of sort of industry discussions, discussions with the regulator and other sort of groups there to be part of the regulation and be part of what's happening right now in Europe in this space. And we believe that we have a huge advantage of being part of those discussions in other countries, such as Gibraltar or the Netherlands, which are much more mature than Sweden is when it comes to the crypto regulatory framework, because they are way ahead of us when it comes to that. Uh, and looking ahead then, at what's happening right now in our space, I'd say that the war in Ukraine is definitely impacting the industry a lot. Uh, the war has led to people that are unable to use regular cash to instead go into crypto to try to circumvent sanction laws. Uh, we have, of course, followed the development very closely, and we were very early on blocking all transactions that were even suspected to be part of this, even before it was uh, sanctioned. So we made sure that we were not part of anything. But it's still interesting to see how this is sort of pushing the crypto community in a way. The development has pushed even harder for the need for a European regulation to sort of take care of this on a holistic view all across Europe, so that no one is going to be able to go into specific regions that are less regulated in order to circumvent those sanctions regulations. The latest news that I've heard indicates that this EU regulation that's been on everyone's lips for, uh, I don't know, two years now, called Mika, is going to be uh, launched earlier than was, what was expected. Maybe a lot to do uh, with this, I'm guessing. And it looks like it's going to be launched sooner and potentially even in the beginning of next year. The purpose of that legislation would be to have a harmonized way of regulating across Europe, but also to regulate it more than it is right now. Right now, in general, Crypto is regulated on the basis of AML and CTF, so preventing money laundering and terrorist financing. But the Mika regulation will add a lot of other stuff, making it more similar to the regulation that we see in the financial industry in general for other financial companies. We think that's a good thing, because a benefit of that is that we, we also get a license, and a license can be passported across Europe, which means that the expansion plans that we have can be increased even further. We can be quicker to come into new markets, we can be quicker at launching stuff, because we can launch it across our own market, which is Europe, at the same time. And it would also have the added benefit of companies such as us, which are self-funded and are able to grow by ourselves, to be able to invest in this and do the right thing, while companies who are potentially not able to do that will not be able to invest the money that, it, that are needed in order to be compliant with this and will be potentially phased out in a way. And also, obviously, not serious companies who are not following the laws and regulations would also be phased out when the regulations are increasing and the supervision is also increasing. So we feel very confident that we will be one of those companies that will benefit from more regulation, which is not always the case, but in this case it is. And that sort of ends the uh, regulatory piece. So I'll hand over to Gustav for some more interesting stuff than this, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, so um, I will now uh, shed some light on some key market features uh, that we here at Quipit think will be crucial for the adoption of cryptocurrency. Um, the perspectives I will go uh, into are payments and uh, DeFi, or decentralized finance in short. So, 
I will start with payments. And the reason for starting with payments are kind of like it's obvious if you have read the Bitcoin white paper because the intention of Bitcoin was to make it a distributed digital cash that solves the double spend problems without the use of a third party intermediary. And if Bitcoin is digital cash or if it's a store of value or if it's both, well, that depends on whom you're asking. So uh, I will not dig in deeper uh, on that subject. Um, but however, the use of cryptocurrency in payments has a lot of perks, and uh, I will present some of them here. So, processing fee. If a merchant today are using a fiat gateway provider, uh, we can take PayPal for instance, the fees connected to that service will often be around 3% or even higher. If that same merchant would use uh, a Bitcoin payment, the fee connected to that services would be around 1%. One, 1 so, well, that is a significant improvement. Another problem that merchants are facing today, and it's, it's one of the biggest problems, are chargebacks. Uh, these are extremely costly. And crypto could potentially solve that problem. And the reason for that is that that crypto transaction is irreversible. And why it's irreversible? Well, it's depending on uh, that it, it's, uh, it has blockchain technology, it's a distributed ledger, and the most key factor, it's encrypted. So a blockchain transaction can only go one way and not the other. So this makes it almost impossible for customers to conduct chargebacks. Another area uh, of benefits is the settlement period for cryptocurrency. A cryptocurrency settlement is uh, instant. Uh, but in order for a uh, crypto, like a bit, okay, we take Bitcoin for example, in order for Bitcoin to reach final settlement, it's around uh, six blocks. And one block is minted every 10 minutes, so it's one hour for a transaction to be final settled. If we compare, compare that to a fiat transaction, the settlement period for a fiat transaction could be days or even weeks if you're unlucky. And if we further the context of an international payment and an international transfer, like a SEPA or wire, well, if you're unlucky, that could even be longer than a week. And this is the real beauty of crypto payments, because it doesn't matter if one part is uh, located in Congo and the other one is in Aus Australia. The settlement period and the transaction speed would be exactly the same as if I would do a transaction with one of you here in the room. It's truly a distributed and international payment system. So. I have now laid out some perks of using crypto payments, um, but how do you actually do a crypto payment and how does the transaction work? Well, I might be uh, a bit technical here, but I will try to oversimplify it and, and shorting it down. So the first you need is obviously you need a wallet. You need a private key and a public key. And the other thing you need is, of course, store some kind of cryptocurrency on that wallet and you need a recipient. And you need the recipient's wallet address. And the wallet address is a shortened version of the public key or a hashed version. Um, and then after you have typed in the wallet address or scanned a QR code or whatever, how, how you want to, to do that, um, you send a transaction and the transaction will start to propagate through all the nodes on the network. And after reaching consensus, the transaction are settled. Even if this process could seem uh, rather easy, it's actually not that uncommon to do a mistake. And due to the irreversibility of a crypto payment, small mistake could actually lead to some significant losses. How to mitigate this? Well, in order for merchant to gain a real adoption uh, with crypto payments, we think that the crypto payment gateway provider is a key. So uh, a crypto payment gateway provider is often connected to multiple chains. Uh, and okay, so. Uh, just to for, uh, I, I forgot to give an example that's uh, quite uh, important here. So if I have an Ethereum wallet and I want to send Ethereum to a friend and my friend has a Bitcoin wallet, bit the Bitcoin and Ether are not on the same blockchain and they're not interruptible with each other. So if I would try to do that transaction, I would risk losing my Ethereum. And this would be a problem if merchant would uh, sh should accept crypto payments because, as you know, there are several thousands of different cryptocurrencies and a wide range of different blockchains. So a crypto payment gateway provider is often connected to multiple chains and will simplify the, the, the transaction. DeFi, or decentralized finance. 
well, DeFi refers to an ecosystem uh, of financial applications uh, that are built on top of blockchain networks. Or uh, you can also refer to a movement that want to create a more uh, inclusive, uh, open, and more in more general, uh, transparent uh, financial ecosystem without the use of a central authority. Many DeFi uh, protocols are um, using uh, the function of a smart contract. And uh, a smart contract, as many of you, uh, you know, probably, uh, or not, is a self-executing uh, pre-coded contract that, uh, um, that executes when a certain criterion is fulfilled. It's basically a, a pre-coded digital vending machine on the internet. As DeFi offers a wide range of, of services, essentially the, the same services as the traditional financial landscape are offering, uh, it would be impossible for me to go over them all here. Uh, so I have choose to focus on uh, one aspect that we here at QuickBit think is very interesting, and that's uh, decentralized lending and borrowing. So how does decentralized lending and borrowing work, and especially without an intermediary? Uh, well, in order for it uh, to work, you need to have an open protocol um, that enables the creation of a liquidity pool. Um, that liquidity pool needs to be built on, up on, up on a smart contract in order for it to be self-executing and uh, free from human interaction. So on the one side, you have the, the lender and depositor. On the other side, you have the borrower. In the middle, you have a liquidity pool. And to give some, uh, some context, and, uh, and you, you can compare that to, to the financial uh, loaning landscape, that where you have a, a, a lender and you have a borrower, and in the middle you have a, either a bank or a financial institution. The difference here is that the liquidity pool does not take the interest. So instead of a bank that are eating up all the interest, the borrower are paying the interest directly to the lender and giving him or her a uh, much higher yield. So the drawbacks of DeFi. Well, due to its early adoption and uh, due to its, the, the early stage of this, uh, this uh, ecosystem, uh, it somehow lacks in user experience. Many protocols are getting hacked and are uh, um, like going down. And it has, has somehow of a technical barrier for people that are not that experienced in this space. So for many of you, especially if you live in a country that are not uh, suffered for much, uh, from much corruption, a central crypto entity or crypto actor could actually be a, be a good fit. Uh, it, often has a smoother interaction, better user interface, um, and you can get exposure to crypto and DeFi, but in a more familiar way. And now I will leave the attention to Soria, our product manager. Thanks, Gustav, and good morning, everyone. So as uh, Gustav and Johan said, my name is Soria. I'm calling from Barcelona, and I'm working with product development at QuickBit. I've joined the company a few months ago, back in, uh, in February, and uh, my mission is to uh, take you through the QuickBit ecosystem and the product vision uh, across the, the, the next few slides. Um, so we, we spent the last year building and developing our uh, consumer app uh, with the aim of providing a simple and user-friendly crypto experience. So the, 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 the QuickBit app is in essence an electronic wallet and an on-ramp platform for early crypto users who want to take part of the crypto adoption without necessarily having the skill, the time, or the ability to be successful in this fast-moving and technical crypto space. Uh, apart from enabling users to buy and sell various crypto assets, QuickBit vision is to implement additional features uh, that act as bridges between traditional and crypto uh, economies. So QuickBit is part of a broader ecosystem, uh, and this slide is meant to illustrate our product vision. Uh, we believe that the combination of a QuickBit app and business solution would generate robust synergies. Uh, it could boost uh, the app user acquisition, for, for, for instance, uh, expand the app usability, so the, uh, the, to make our app more appealing, and generate, obviously, new re revenue streams. So as, as explained by my colleague Johan at the beginning of the presentation, we have recently 
achieved a major milestone in collaboration with our partner Intergyro. Uh, we are now offering uh, our app users the possibility to get a virtual IBAN as well as a Visa card connected to uh, the QuickBit wallet. Uh, we have successfully launched this feature in the home of QuickBit, Sweden, and we are planning to roll it out in all the supported jurisdictions. So our app is clearly now uh, bridging uh, the crypto and the fiat economies. Um, in regards to uh, the QuickBit app development, the next feature uh, in the pipeline embraces uh, DeFi principle and it will be addressed to the market as the Earn Wallet. Uh, thanks uh, to Gustav's explanation about DeFi, you should have uh, all a good idea of what DeFi is and what our earned wallet will offer. But the, the idea, in a sense, is uh, very simple. So just imagine a saving account, but uh, with crypto instead of fiat. Um, this feature uh, will allow app users to stake the coins, uh, uh, one of the eight currency we support, with the perspective of high returns. Um, so the development is going well. Uh, we are aiming to launch uh, the product by Q4 2022. Um, we believe that the app users' organic growth would be faster uh, if we extend our value proposition to business solutions, meaning our upcoming merchant platform. Uh, in other terms, we want to develop payment solutions which would leverage QuickBit app features as well as the QuickBit technical infrastructure. Uh, Gustav, uh, earlier in this presentation, described several issues that merchants and businesses face frequently, uh, and our product and tech, tech team are exploring, investigating different use cases with uh, a problem-solving approach. So traditional businesses uh, in general tend to be crypto-averse. Uh, from uh, the dialogues uh, QuickBit has with these industry-leading firms, uh, the main reasons they are reluctant to crypto is are related to the lack of awareness about crypto, uh, the crypto inherent uh, complexity, uh, the tax exposure as well uh, on crypto gain in certain jurisdictions such as Sweden, for instance, uh, the reluctance to include crypto in balance sheets as well, because it's, it creates new complexity, and obviously uh, the lack of trust regarding uh, the origin of funds. That being said, embracing crypto uh, as a supported payment currencies uh, would leverage key benefits for uh, businesses. Uh, amongst those benefits, instant settlement, cross-border settlement, quick cash to access, chargeback free, low processing fees, uh, or the main opportunities for these, uh, these businesses. Uh, we could also support closed loop mechanism, so the capability to support pay and refund within the same loop. Uh, that is super compliant and it will please my uh, colleagues from the uh, risk and the FCU, FCU team. Uh, and obviously it would boost also the incremental values uh, for uh, those merchants. Uh, so in the following slides, I will be a little bit uh, technical and I will take you through a few use cases we have been investigating and thinking about. So how could this business accept crypto? Uh, we are exploring the opportunity to leverage quick bit app features in order to offer a cheap, simple and secure payment method to app users and merchants, as well as benefiting from a broad range of app native uh, features such as the virtual IBAN, the quick bit visa card and soon the DN wallet. So let me take you uh, for a short ride and let's imagine a user journey that could be as simple as the following. Um, the user um, selects QuickBit to complete a purchase on an online store. QuickBit would then uh, display um, a receipt with the payment details and the crypto conversion, as well as a pay button. Once the customer or the, the user has clicked on the pay button, the user, the user would get uh, a payment request through the QuickBit app and will have the opportunity to approve it with one tap. Um, then it's up to the merchant to either hold this crypto, depending on this uh, crypto appetite, or, uh, and leave it on the business wallet, or we, QuickBit, could convert the, the customer payment into a fiat uh, currency. So not, we don't have plenty of choices, but we are supporting euro at the moment and we are planning to expand to more local currencies. Uh, and then QuickBit will initiate a, a fiat bank settlement to the merchant bank account. So offering a payment solution fully hosted on QuickBit ledgers 
would maximize security. Um, all our users are fully KYC uh, on our end, and it will also simplify the merchant crypto experience and management. So the, the merchant is basically just getting a settlement in fiat directly on the local bank account. Um, alternatively, we are also investigating a global solution that could support external wallets, which would open uh, to a larger pool of uh, customers. So the main idea would be uh, to offer a universal payment solution that enables merchants to get paid in a selection of coins from non-QuickBit users in that case. Uh, this would help merchants to embrace cryptocurrency in a holistic way, and therefore it could generate incremental revenues and decrease payment processing fees. Uh, the type of solution is meant to uh, reach a larger pool of crypto users, and we could imagine the flow as follows. So the two first steps are just the regular checkout uh, flow uh, that exists in the previous flow I showed you. Uh, but the, it changes from the third step where we, a quick bit, uh, collect uh, the coins from uh, the, the clients of our merchants. So we would display an invoice with a locked in uh, exchange rate. The consumer would either scan uh, the uh, QR code. Uh, on the screen, or we'll copy and paste the, the address uh, for the crypto to be sent to. And then again, it's up to the merchant to hold this crypto on a, a business wallet or uh, request a uh, automated swap to fiat currency that would be sent via uh, bank transfer uh, the day after, for, in for instance. Um, Accepting crypto and processing crypto payments represent a fantastic opportunity for a B2C perspective. Um, on the B2B side, we have captured several challenges that could be solved with uh, our uh, current capabilities as well. So the world is becoming smaller than ever. Uh, it's not unusual to have uh, to, to handle payments from and to clients in Asia, in Americas or in Africa. And we could think about an OTC or exchange uh, service. So that could allow businesses to receive settlement from all, over, all around the world. As opposed to traditional international uh, cross-border protocol, uh, remittance uh, is uh, with crypto is cheap, fast, and direct. We were talking about uh, earlier uh, through the staff presentation about the uh, uh, SWIFT uh, rail, for instance, which is an old rail uh, that has uh, different transition, transit banks. So it's costly, lengthy, and, and a bit unstable as well, because uh, a, a corresponding bank could stop the payment and bounce it back to uh, the source. So quick bit infrastructure and core function could leverage, uh, could be leveraged, and this could help businesses to become crypto friendly without adding the complexity in their accounting and tax management. Uh, so so let's, let's just take a, a very simple use case. Uh, let's take a, a company A, which is a European based uh, company, marketing agency that runs digital campaigns for a company B based in Latin America. At the end of each month, uh, Company A uh, invoices Company B for the provided marketing services. Uh, without, uh, with the traditional rail, uh, which is SWIFT, uh, the, the, the settlement, as I said, would become, uh, for Company B, costly, lengthy, and unsteady. So the Company B, the LATAM-based company, insists to pay its international supplier in B2C, in this scenario. On the other end, Company A wants to be paid uh, as ASAP and is reluctant to hold any crypto assets. We could offer our uh, value proposition exactly to solve that problem. Um, we have a, a, a specific use case where we could imagine a business interface where the company A logs into QuickBit portal and inputs the amount of BTC uh, to be swapped. Uh, QuickBit displays the swap offer with a locked-in uh, exchange rate, which would be for 15 or 30 minutes, for instance. QuickBit collects the coins directly from Company B, the LATAM company that has to pay the uh, uh, European-based company, and then we would convert the coins into fiat uh, currency and settle it to the local bank account of uh, the um, uh, uh, Company uh, A. So, as you can see in this model, um, 
both payee and payer benefit from uh, that new rail. Uh, the payee uh, who received the money in local bank accounts within days would be happy for that, uh, as opposed to SWIFT, uh, to, to a SWIFT transfer. And even for the payer who is paying the, the, the processing fee to send the money, it would be cheaper than uh, the traditional rail. Um, that's, that's all from my end. I hope uh, you all learned something about the industry and enjoy uh, the presentation. Uh, it's, it's time for me to pass the microphone to my colleague Johan, uh, who will run the uh, Q&A session. Thank you. And that's it, ready for Q&A. All right, thank you cool. so much for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering to start off, uh, you have recently launched uh, a, a B2C uh, product in, in the card uh, that was launched in Sweden. I know it's early days now, but maybe you could just quickly elaborate a bit on how the perception has been in terms of user reviews, maybe some, some growth numbers and such. Sorry, do you want to go or should we? Please, please do. <laughs> okay. My impression is that it's been well received. Uh, all of the feedback that we're, we're getting is good. So it's very early days still. We had the uh, sort of trial uh, product out first, which was to a limited number of people. And now we've just done sort of the full launch of it. And so far, it seems like all of the sort of technical stuff works, the product works as we wanted it to, and people are seeing, seem to receive it very well. So, uh, so far, so good, I would say. And for an international expansion then of your B2C offering, of course, you evaluate new markets. Uh, could, could you elaborate a bit on, on how you weigh in on you know, the regulatory environment versus uh, the crypto adaption? H how do you consider these factors uh, and which one weighs more heavily? I would say that we are trying to, th that's one part of it, sort of the regulatory environment and also the crypto adaption. But another layer to it is also where we have traction with other products. So going back to what I said before, that we are trying to make sure that the products are linked to each other. If we have, for instance, good traction with the affiliate or the merchant product in the market, that could be a reason to launch the app in that market because we can get good sort of uh, interactions between the products and, and sort of give the users and the merchants a better uh, experience. So. Obviously, it's uh, since the, the sort of licensing and registration regime differs a lot between countries, it's going to be one factor into is this worth uh, going into this market, which is not always the case. Um, but again, it's more around making sure that we don't have to start from scratch anywhere, which we don't really have to since we're already sort of here and there when it comes to the European market, I would say. Mm, thank you. Uh, and, and of course, there's been great volatility in many of, of crypto assets recently. Could you just remind us quickly on the dynamic between uh, asset volatility and your revenue generation? Is it mainly the volume volatility? Is it price volatility? And, and how do these factors, uh, uh, how do they affect your revenue uh, generation? Uh, again, not being a numbers guy, uh, but, but I, what I do know is the fact that what we're offering is a way for people to use crypto to pay and a way for merchants to accept crypto as payment. It's not an investment product. It's not like you buy crypto to have it as an investment. So from our point of view, it doesn't matter if a Bitcoin is worth $1,000 or $10,000 or 100000 The point is that we want to have this seamless experience across it. So. I would say from our revenue point of view, at least, it doesn't really matter how much it's worth uh, because we always tie it to a uh, euro or dollar value anyway when it, we do the payments and stuff like that. So it doesn't really affect the revenue uh, from, uh, from what I know, at least, whatsoever, mm. uh, which can also be seen over the sort of last few days when it's been very volatile, I would say. Mm, perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.